I I wasn't doing too well at school and I was quite an angry man. Um, and that led into drinking drugs as a young 13, 14 year old. And we stood in that office and the colour sergeant said, right, pat yourselves on the back, gentlemen. You've all just joined the Royal Marines. Commando 369, I am just, I am open to the world and the universe and how it speaks. Hello, friends. I hope this finds you firing on this another day in our paradise. I'm absolutely delighted to uh, bring to you another awakened veteran. Um, we've done a lot of veterans chats over the years. And I won't hold back here, folks. When you look at what's going on in the world, when you look at the way that our forces are being used and abused it people have got to start talk speaking up about it people have got to start speaking about what was their military experience you know um really like and we do that because we're on the warrior's journey and we stand up for the children and that means that we speak our peace we speak honestly and we speak humbly but but we speak that is why i'm delighted to welcome Daniel to the show, my fellow um, brother, Royal Marine. Although that's gonna, that gets me in trouble now because people are like, "Whoa, why are you proud to be a, a murderer for the state? And I'm like, it's complicated, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is complicated, very complicated. Yes. Um. So let, let's start with that then. So, you know, my thing, Daniel, I, I was homeless sleeping in a Renault 12, having been through, you know, this is a euphemism now, lots of stuff over the years, stuff I don't even want to go there because it's all dealt with. It's fine. I live in paradise now, so it must have been in my life for, for a reason, although I, I do appreciate that people are, you know, still struggling. And um, when my mate bet me I couldn't join the toughest military you know, infantry training course in the world, the Royal Marines Commandos, I was such a, like, I had such a intense, bitter anger in me that you don't tell me what I can and can't do. So, Daniel, over to you. Yeah. How did you end up in the military? Um, again, very much like you said, um, trauma background growing up, um, not through a family that didn't love me. My family loved me wholeheartedly. I come from a broken family. My dad was away. My mum looked after me. I had a good, beautiful pair, uh, grandparents. Um, but sadly, my granddad passed away, um, which is a trauma in my life. And I, I wasn't doing too well at school and I was quite an angry man. Um, and that led into drinking drugs as a young 13, 14 year old, um, and then that just kind of exacerbated. You you surround yourself with so many different types of people that are also quite traumatized, and um, it feels normal. Uh, and there's plenty of people out there that don't go through what I went through, uh, and I'm proud of everything I've gone through. It's led me to where we are today. Um, but I suppose there's a message of hope, right? That trauma starts from a child, uh, and if you don't get that early on, if you don't get a good start, um, yeah. Anyway, so I'm going off talk. So how do I get to the Marines? So I, I didn't do the last year and a half of school. I went back for my GCSEs. I was like predicting Bs across the board, but again, I've been led astray. Um, I spent five, six months on a traveller site, the Isaacs up in Somerset, and that was quite grounding to see how um, a different part of society lives. Um, uh, massive respect to them people. They're good people, um, regardless of what people think. 
is that inner peace that they have. That's why they're so happy in themselves. Um, but I then met my wife, Catherine, my light, my cornerstone, bedrock foundation. She moved from Colchester. She was 16. I think I was 17 and a bit. And she moved into my village. I'd applied to be a Navy diver, but again, ego and arrogance at that time. I joined, tried to be a Navy diver and I failed the asymmetric test. Um, so I, cut, I come back, swanning around, giving it, yeah, I'm going to join the Navy, I'm going to join the Army. And uh, my beautiful wife, Catherine, went, yeah, my brother's in the Army. And I was like, <clears throat> that scuppered my plans. So I was like, yeah, I'll join the Army, I'll join the Army. Um, and after two weeks of court and there was such as a young man, I walked through the threshold of her of her house, her mum's house, mum and dad's house, and met her father, who was like 22, 24 years in the military. Um, very strong, not powerful is the wrong word, a very strong, good man. Um, and as I've gone into the kitchen, I've seen uh, the laminated A3 piece of paper, Commando Training Centre, Royal Marines. Uh, so I thought, crikey, ego driven again. Can't be second best to your brother. So I'll join a Majesty's Finest. Um, and that was the initial reasons behind it. And I wanted to escape the life I was living. I'd never say that I'd end up in prison or dead or on. I think I was far stronger than that. I think I knew I was doing wrong. But due to my social influences and a, a breaking strain of a wet Kit Kat, um, I, I couldn't say no. Uh, and what happens when you don't say no is you if you don't have the strength inside of you to say no. Um, people will take advantage of you, situations will take advantage of you, and the universe as we know it, um, God, whatever you ever you pray to, the universe is what I say about Lord Jesus Christ, our God. Um, it's, it's a vibrational thing, right? And it just lowers your vibration. But um, they're the basic reasons why I joined, ego driven, and I wanted to start a new life. Um, and um, let's be fair, RMC, Royal Marines Commandos, Her Majesty's Finest, what better way to do it than do it in style? Yes. Um, what was your personal experience then of of being in the core? Oh, again, I, like... I, I think us, I think veterans tend to sort of have the rose tinted glasses on and remember the good bits. Yeah. So let's let's be real about this, right? Um, it's it's not all roses, it's not at all. So day one, week one, foundation block, quite a big character that I am. Come, I was Dan Stewart from the Oval Town, you know, scrapper Dan, don't mess with me, ego driven. Um, walked into foundation block and after swearing in, there was a guy called Douglas, nice guy. Um, he was again very ego driven, uh, and he wanted to pretty much split the troop. So it was handbags at 30 paces down the ablutions before it even started. So day one, week one, I found myself knuckle deep in a scrap as such, but I say it was handbags. Um, then through training, I wasn't the smartest bloke. I think I failed my weapon and the test about seven times. Just that pressure and stress, lack of sleep. You're like a rabbit in headlights with 60 other lads that think they're just as awesome, if not more awesome than you. And it's, um, it's it, it for me... It was very humbling, and it really questioned my own ability and integrity. And Gary, to be fair, um, like I say, it, it wasn't easy. I got I got injured at week twenty or something. I spent six to eight months in under troop. And again, as little as a trauma may be, I left nine three three troop behind, uh, and that was massive for me. Right? They were they were the lads. They were the boys I joined up with. They're all unknown. That's massive, um, Daniel. That's massive for everyone I've ever spoke to. Yeah, uh, it's massively overlooked by people who pass out as originals. Yeah. Um, the, you know, that trauma of like starting something and then suddenly you get put in a position where it's possible you might not finish. Not only that, you got to rejoin a whole new, you know, a whole new yeah. team. Yeah. And, you know, we, we didn't really judge back troopers in our troop. Um, oh, they do. They do. Well, we, we, I mean, my best mate to this day was a back trooper quite early on when, when, when we were, and I never, oh, I had nothing but admiration because he was bloody good at everything. And he was a really nice and, you know, true boot net, real nice guy. Yeah. And, um, hello, Steve. <laughs> and, um, on the other hand, you knew you was going to get some biffs. <laughs> And they were still welcomed. Yeah. But some of them started to show their true colours, why they would get, why the training teams were rolling them over. They, did, they didn't want them to pass out, basically. And one guy, no. I, I, one guy I was like so glad when he got binned. Um, 
don't know if it's he ever sad. Had. It's sad, isn't it, that we think like that, but no, I was I was glad he was being because he threatened to knife me. Oh wow. And remember wow, well, yeah. remember what I said earlier. I I was an angry young man. You don't threaten me. Yeah. I I, I will scheme and I will plot. <laughs> Me, most, mostly in my head, but yeah. you know, I'm <laughs> yeah. not I'm not gonna you know, I will not bat an eye when we say goodbye to you, Sunshine. On the other hand, I'll do anything for anyone if you know, if they're a good person. <laughs> Amen. Amen to that. Yeah. And and that's what it is. It's about surrounding yourself with good people, right? They're good for you and your vibration. Um, and there's there are some hoofing, for those who don't know what hoofing is, there are some proper good people in the core. But you get that in all walks of life, right? Good and bad people. Like I think you have got to be proud of of your life experience. Uh hundred percent you have. It brought it brings you to exactly where you and I are and many others are in, in life experience and life journeys. But the, the big corporations as such, the military, the, the banks, um, the hidden agendas. I think a lot more people are seeing it nowadays. And the problem is we wear a certain set of lenses uh, and we take those lenses off and on every now and again when something sticks home in our heart. But when we start talking filtered water, non, non-fluoride, uh, toothpaste, uh, healthy living, our alkaline diet... Um, and we talk about the big, the big powers, the super giants. The I don't say their names, but we know the big, the big club. When we start talking about that, we have to be careful because people then look at us like we're we're warped and we're we're the we're the nuts ones. Um, but if anyone knows me and my journey, they'll understand that what I've gone from to what I am now, and I've found inner peace, right? Um, but that isn't pursuing all the things that they lay out to you on social media uh, and the TV every day, whether it be the new iPad, the new car, whatever it is, it's driven by power and money to make you unhappy because the minute you commit to the newest car, the next iPad, the four and a half grand holiday that you can't afford, you're then locked in a cycle of work and then you have to work to live and you have to live, you have to do more. You're locked into your job Um and life is about freedom. It's about spending time with your family. It's about love, peace, inner peace, unity, respect, and unpacking people's words and listening. A lot of people are hurting out there, and they can't see the wood through the trees. And a few simple steps, just a few simple steps, baby steps. You Like you said, Chris, you can wake up in paradise every day, mm. but you don't make them steps. You you don't don't take those little, little warnings, not warnings, those... With little clippers of advice that stick in your heart, and you think, "Why? Why is that resonating with me?" Because it because it means something. It's a higher purpose talking to you subconsciously, and we just choose to ignore it. Drink, drugs, alcohol, gambling, women, fast cars, fast lives. It's all about slow is smooth, smooth is fast, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't know if I'm going off a little bit. No, no, no. You're absolutely fine, mate. I just wanted to go back a bit, and and, and... yeah. I, I, for, I forgot to add a little bit on the end to my little rant there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what I was saying is the reason I don't want people comparing themselves to anything, uh. whether it's, you know, a guy that works in a shoe shop or some bloke on the SAS front line is because if you live in the past, mm. you cannot enter enlightenment. No, it doesn't no. work like that. If you've, so got I, an, I, go if you've got an anchor and you've tied it to yourself, and you've chucked it into the past, the past that does not exist. I just also wanted to cover, um, you know, I'm dealing with a Royal Marine at um, the moment. I won't say in what capacity or what, but, you know, he was bullied mercilessly in the Corps. Listen, I'm not sort of outing the Marines as being like notorious for it. What I'm outing is whenever you get a body of young testosterone fueled men, many of whom have got damaged backgrounds and, and et cetera, et cetera. And you're in a volatile environment where there's a lot of pressure on you to perform. It, it, it's a natural consequence is you're going to get hierarchies. You're going to get, you know, what do you call it? Like exclusion. You're going to get people taking out their own damage project. They call it projection, don't they? Projecting it onto other people um, and this kind of thing. And 
I think that's something about the military that really doesn't get talked about. Yeah, <clears throat> I can elaborate on that, I suppose. So, again, I, I alluded to at the start that I wasn't the most switched on bootneck as such initially. Um, and then, again, I, I got out into the big bike wide world of the core. Um, and, again, I felt like a little fish in a massive ocean. Uh, and on numerous occasions, I wouldn't say, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's borderline bullying. It is bullying. I had my uh, cupboard drawer, my, my wardrobe doors ripped off and stamped over. On a, on a company run, um, they know who they are. You know, I'm not here to name and shame people, but through their traumas, they thought it was rather funny to uh, do that and cause me concern and distress, which I look back then, it was slightly stressful, but I suppose I'd had quite a bully childhood, um, being Stuart and Ford. I get called Ford Escort, Ford Orion. So it was water off the duck's back, but I would say... Bullying in the in the military, and I don't like referring to the military. Like I say, I'm proud of what I was, and I was a Majesty's Royal Marines finest or Royal Marines commando. But I think bullying is inherent in in the armed forces. We know it, um, and again, it just doesn't get talked about. Um, and it's a shame because, like, whether it's your corporals giving you a massively hard time when clearly the information is not going in, and that aggressive response is not paramount to my growth. If they can't see that then it's, it's a pointless evolution. You can, you, like when I failed my weapon and test, I went in the tank, I went crawling up and down, leper crawling, and I was in that much of a fluster. I was going through the motions, safety catch, changes of the sights, working parts to rear, working parts forward, forward assist, back in the game. I was that flustered that I was going through the motions. And that's what a lot of people do in life, just go through the motions. All I had to do was switch that, that's change lever from repetitive, multiple fire or rapid fire to repetition. But again, because I was in flap stations at a thousand feet and climbing, and it wasn't going in, that that shouty screaming kind of round the, round the rock, round the block, and back to me, it doesn't work for everyone. Um, and as soon as the, the military realised that actually talking to people with humility and love and understanding and knows that we're all on different life journeys and we all just need a hand up, right? We're not all generic. We are all the same. We all come from the same place, but we're all at different stages of our life journey. And the minute we understand that and look into people's eyes, I won't go to the Bible just yet, but unpack each other with the senses we've been given, our eyes, ears, mouth, nose and heart, and look into the souls of our eyes. A lot of people just, just need that understanding. And that's lost in civilianship, in civil work, in, in, in society, and in the military or the armed forces. Mm. And it needs to be a massive change. We need to take a stand back and look at ourselves inwardly and outwardly and go, would I like to be talked like that? Would I benefit from that sort of response? Am I going to learn from that? And no is the answer. Quite clearly, no. Um, but yeah. So yeah, bullying is definitely there, but it's just not talked about. Sadly. Dan, Dan, you served in the Middle East. I did. I did indeed. Yeah. Can you tell yeah. us a bit? Uh, give me, give yeah. Yeah. So a of that. Overview of that was uh, part of the uh, 42 Commander Royal Marines Group, Battle Group South, uh, Herrick 9, uh, from September 08 to April 09. There are Instagram pages we can look at. It. Uh, we had the Sun newspaper with us. We had Plymouth Live. Uh, and we conducted strike operations from Kandahar and Bastion all over the hell, all over southern Afghanistan. Um, and it was progressive. So initially, it was quite calm although we're all on eggshells, right, because we're young lads in an unfamiliar territory, not really understanding everything that's been delivered to us. Um, but it soon picked up. Um, most notably, we've done an op called Op Sunshara, where we dropped down into, I believe it was the South Nanali districts, and then we systematically walked 54 kilometres over 30, 40 days uh, from, like, November to just after December, uh, just after Christmas, um, systematically just pushing the enemy or flushing the enemy out or what we were led to believe, which there were, we were in contact from the minute we got on the ground on the, not on the night. Um, but the Sunshara, was, I'll, I'll, if I go into it just quite bluntly, uh, there was there was a lot of lads, K Company took casualties, um, we took casualties. And for me, we talk to them about talking about me, but my lads, Lima lads, um, sadly, we lost Ben Watley on Christmas Eve. Got through the throat, out out through the back, uh, and that's where my massive trauma comes from, because ego driven again. I was quite a fit young man, destined to go and be an ML two, and um, 
when he got pulled off that roof, it's it's flashpoint, right? Uh, react or, or or don't, and, and I did, but, but ego driven. I wanted to save his life because I'd been built up to believe that I'm a super army soldier. Um, so I jumped on that stretcher and and I ran and I ran and I ran so fast. I could, I, I know now I couldn't have run no faster. We're under contact. The RAF refused to land because mortar and ordnance, one hundred and five shells, sporadic uh, seven six two was coming in. Um, IV hanging out of him it was just yeah. It was to this day. Like, there's still blank spots. Do I don't know who's on that stretcher, um, but we got to the compound with uh, Eddie Stout, Sergeant Major, beautiful, amazing, good bloke, um, and uh, uh, good, yeah, good mate, of mine. Yeah, absolute legend of a man. Really good bloke. Um, and uh, sadly, mate, I sat on my knees and next to next to Eddie the other side and watched Ben's life pass out the soles of his eyes. I, I write poetry about it. I'll, I can put it up at some point. Um, it's deep and dark, right? But it was a connect tour. Uh, but moving forward, so I don't go off on a massive ramp, um, it was. It got progressive from there. We then went into Op Diesel in the upper Sangam Valley with the SF Call Signs SB lads uh, and done like a 24, 48-hour strike ops. Again, smashing up, uh, up, up Opium Labs and just, just taking the fight to the enemy. Um uh, you, then, um, do do you believe they were your enemy? No. So my my view and standpoint now is one man's terrorist, another man's freedom fighter. Right. So through hindsight and reflection and growth, I look back and go. So a, a situation for me was going for, into a compound at night and having the LMG uh, and losing my footing, uh, and then on putting my light on to see what was below me. It was a, a family of young children, and then I go right. I've got three young children, one of 15, one of 12, and one of six. They are my life. They are my everything. I'll go through, through, through you, I, you know, I lay my alarms, life on the line for them. No question of a doubt. And then I go, imagine what they do if someone kicked in my door and then stood on my children. What would you do? I'll tell you what, unless you had control like I have now, a rage would build. Mm. And you you would not be a happy person, and you'd go. ISAF forces, we don't see Royal Marine Commandos or Coldstream Guards or or whatever other people have worked out there. We just see a target, a, a person in a similar uniform that has come in and trauma. And the key word there is trauma. Trauma. My wife, me, took my house is my home, it's my kingdom, it's my fortress. And you just walked in and stepped on my children. Now, nah, mate, you'd want vengeance, and rightly so. That's not to say that through getting vengeance, you're going to get peace because because you're not. You've got to be the bigger person and let it go. But if you've lost someone innocently, and um, let's be fair, who are we to say that we're innocent or not? Because a lot of them can't speak English, let alone Pashtun or read or write. We we just presume by what we're told that they're there, they're a threat to life. But it's far more complex than do you, we even understand. Danny, do you know, I mean, I don't know how much research you've done but i was and and for people listening probably I, i'm guessing because i see sort of comments that go a lot of people don't understand we went into that country off the back of a certain uh let's just call it a big event but you do your research online uh, it, people are saying no this is part of a of a new world order um and this is the bankers who've had a you know, a thumb screw on Europe going back 400 years, if, if, not if not before. Um, and I, I just think it's interesting, Daniel, there's not many people having this conversation, mate. Are they? There was Ben Griffin, SAS, bless him. Nah. Nah. There's not mate, because again, we, we talk about what, what they're selling to us and what we're eating up for breakfast, uh, whether it be food, social media interactions, the narrative they they choose to give. Even my family, when I talk about it, they're like, just leave it alone, Dan. You know, they get the, the, I suppose the general consensus is if, if there's nothing you can do about it, so why talk about it? Um, so I think there's more people out there that are more privy to these these atrocities that have gone on and people we've pursued around the world and in, 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 in the bit of our nation and uh, security. Um, but again, when, when you're talking to young influential men and selling a dream and it, it is a dream, right? I mean, when to join the military and 
feel see the world. Um, fortunately for me, when I left the Marines because my career was cut caught, uh, cut short, cut cut short. Um, I went off and done private school in a maritime gig, and I was able to travel the world. And again, traveling is beautiful, right? Because when you travel, you realize that there's so many less fortunate people around the world than what we wake up to every day. But they found peace. They are happy with what they've got, and uh, it's not a lot. And if you could take anything away from from anyone, just just get yourself out there to the world, guys. They they don't want you traveling. Of course they don't. Why would they want you traveling and seeing how beautiful the world is? And I'm not talking materialistic. I'm not talking sunsets where those sunsets and moons are beautiful, absolutely truly beautiful gifts we've been given by the Lord our God. Um, I'm talking about the inner peace that less fortunate people have, where it be. So I'm chatting to people called uh, Greater Hope of Ministry in Uganda. Um, and then this Sri Lanka, let, just Africa, like the less fortunate, like, you know, we sponsor a child in Bolivia, the Compassion Group. Um, like £30 a month, guys, right? It's But that makes a big difference, right? I mean, it's, it's all about helping people understand that happiness starts at home. And once you find that inner peace, you can see that, Inner peace is, is I, I say it all the time, it's but a few steps away, but I'll spend 10, 12, 15 years not being that guy, being suppressed by a lower vibration, by by buying the iPads. I always talk about iPads, I don't wish to genericize, by buying the Mercedes, which I had, um, big TVs, new sofas, new bike, even new clothes. Like, just it's not about any materialistic item. It's about that inner peace. I've gone off track and I'm sorry. No, well, I that's a good... You've opened the door there for me to come in and say the mental health problem in the veterans community is enormous. The substance yeah. misuse problem is enormous. The homelessness statistics are enormous. And some... And, and this is going to be talked about by those of us that have been there. Yeah, definitely. And, it needs to be talked about. And while people live in the past, whether that's trauma, whether that's holding on to, tra to, to trauma, whether it's living in the identity, in this case, it's a military uniform identity, while they insist on doing that, clinging to a past that literally does not exist, they've got the anchor in again, haven't they? And they wonder why they're not going forward. And they wonder why they keep failing and they keep spiraling down with the alcohol and the substances. Yeah. And 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 this is why, you know, these are un these are tough conversations to have. But but I think, um, you know, somebody's got to have them, and someone's also got to look at the role of the military now and what it's for. It's just crazy. But for me, Daniel, I had to understand this in order to go forward. I could see, you know, when you're a slave to the to the matrix and all you know is what the big clubs indoctrinated you with through school, through uni, through military, um, through your diet, through your television yeah. screen. Um, you know, you how can you progress into the light and find that paradise that we all deserve? when you're massively indoctrinated. So that's why that's, you know, that's why I mention it. Yeah. We're just suppressed again, like you said, from such a young age. Uh, and I, I, I do feel for the older generations because they're not as privy to the understanding and the technological use that we have nowadays. So they, they have just followed the narrative all their life. And this is, this is not a, a point of finger and saying you need to get, get rid of times. It, but it's, it is a case of now that, information whether it be through books and there's some beautiful books out there but we just step away from because we want to watch tv whether it be through books or through google or there's so much free information out there to start your journey but all it takes is you to switch off that tv and go how do i become a better person how how do i and there's not even leave my ego at the door it's it's something as simple as fluoride right there's been an independent study that's been done that says that over the 54 states is it in America, depending on the level of fluoride in the water, depend, dependent on the level of intelligence in each state, we a lot of people brush their teeth with fluoride. Now, this is free information, guys. I know I sound nuts. Go to Amazon. Get yourself a dip test. Go on, put, put it in your local water that comes out of taps and see what comes out. Yeah, it's clear. But just because it's clear doesn't mean it's safe. 
And, mm. and I'm not saying that everyone can afford to do that, but we have to make little steps into this enlightenment. And I'm, I'm not sitting here on my ivory tower saying that I've been a good man because I haven't, right? I've lived in the past 10, 15, 20 odd years. And there's always been this aching in my heart that I knew that was better and I, I could make a change. But I was so caught up on the past of what I should have done better. I'm, yeah, I'm this, I'm that. Just as Elsa said, you've got to let it go. You have. And I don't know how much time I've got, but I've done... I've done a week in hospital where through trauma and holding on to the past, my stomach doesn't work. I've got something called ulcerative colitis slash early Crohn's. So I spent a week in hospital having IVs. I'm now having biological transfusions where my T receptors are replaced. Um, that spite, and I come off my medication because my mother passed away on Christmas Day. Another trauma that I have let go, believe it or not, because I know she's around me she's in a better place but i'd go carry on i had three weeks so the week in hospital um i come back with a new lease of life but i've stopped taking my medication without doctor supervision which i don't recommend to anybody but i wanted to feel emotionally available again and i know that these tablets were suppressing me antipsychotics i'm not psychotic i'm just a lack of understanding of life but anyway I started acting irrationally because my emotions floodgates started opening up. And I've been on a journey of spiritual alignment for a long time, whether it be through yoga, through breath work, through the Lord Jesus Christ, through meditation, through clean eating, water. Um, but I've become erratic. My wife left me, uh, and rightly so, because it was it was needed to snap me back into the reality. But I've been so happy. I've, it had been a week of being in hospital, of being prodded and poked and being told, if you don't manage your stress levels you're going to end up with a bag, a stoma bag. I'm 37 years old. I don't want to have a stoma bag. And no, just, Anyway, I end up I end up then having a two and a half hour standoff with the police in my van, uh, Timmy Horton, so everyone that wants to know, um, where I was, my wife left me, I bought a lovely bit of lamb. I, I wanted to share it. She wasn't coming back with the kids. So I was out in the street with my van, I had a roast dinner and I was giving food away. I was just trying to be a good bloke. I thought 30 odd quid's worth of meat. I don't want to go to waste. I can't eat all that. Um, someone reported me for slaughtering a lamb on the street. Do you know what I mean? So then my mate picked me up for a coffee and I was, no, 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 I'll take my van. Um, anyway, for whatever reason, they reported me to the police. Um, I just got to hot chocolate lattes at Timmy Hortons and the police decided to, and again, this is not this is not a pointing finger at the police, the boots on the ground, they trapped me brilliantly. Um, but they ripped the keys out of my, over my right shoulder, which then sent me to a thousand feet and climbing and I was triggered. There was a two and a half hour standoff. They had to get a psychiatrist out to me to just to confirm that I wasn't nuts and I wasn't slaughtering a lamb on the street, which is just mad. Um, and then I got blue lighted to A and E, where I was then uh, left for 17, 18 hours because the NHS and the blue light service is so underfunded. On a bench outside of Derriford A and E with two police escorts for 17 hours, 18 hours. Um, they then decided to section me under Section 2 of the Mental Health Act because I'd had a godlike moment, god complex. And there's a bit in the middle where I went off around Bickley, barefoot running, uh, threw away my uh, Elliot Brown watch, I threw away my van keys. Um, I was I was bee marching or, or running with barefoot with my top off out in the wilderness. But where I'm going with that is, yes, I was out of touch, but it was grounding. I went back to nature I lost my van keys, but I left the van open. I mean, like, that's not someone that does anything kind of, like, psychotic, but they called it godlike syndrome. Um, so, anyway, they then, they arrested me, or put me, section me under Section 2 of the Mental Health Act for up to 28 days, and then escorted me from A&E round to uh, Glenbourne Health Award. Uh, my wife and father, my father had come down from London uh, to see me, make sure I was all right, and I wasn't clearly all right. Um, I know I'm ranting a bit here, but I'm going, where I'm going with it is, this whole time in hospital has been fundamentally eye-opening to me because it kept me away. I've been able to look at myself inwardly and uh, find myself. Uh, I am slightly medicating on a baby dose, they call it. Um, but more importantly, I'm looking after myself. I'm not looking into the past. I've let go of all labels and egos. I want to help people, right? I want I want to help people with power of photography and on the social media platforms at some point that – Heaven, like you say, or paradise is but a few steps away. But you've got to live in the present moment. It, that's why it's called a present, right? Because it's a gift. We get to wake up with air in our lungs and we get to breathe and live. Like heaven on earth, man. People say hell on earth. Nobody. Just seeing it through a different set of lenses. 
if you just make them small changes by investing in yourself and then giving out to your loved ones and others, the universe knows, man. The God, the God we pray to knows. But anyway, I'm going off. Sorry. That's fine. It's, it's your chat. It's your chat. So you kind of had a like um traumatizing stroke emotional experience. Yeah. Was that when you saw the light? Yeah, I suppose if I'm being quite open and honest, it, for me, it was religion. Like, my granddad was a missionary, my dad's a born-again Christian, uh, and it's it's in our lifeblood, it's, it's, it's in who we are. Um, but post-Afghan, I obviously stepped away from the Lord, but I then joined St. James of Less Church on Ham Drive. Um, I was scaffolding the place, and then I decided to take my wife and kids one Sunday. And and the vibration I got, the, the good feeling, the... The, the the energy inside me, the, the goosebumps from listening to the music and having an understanding. But as quick as I'd come to it, I'd come away and I'd do something like drink or drugs. Or uh, I, I, I lived on about three to four hours sleep the last 10 years. And I just couldn't sleep because I was ruminating, holding on to the past. Um, but, I, but I think for me, I think coming to the light for me was definitely my religion of obviously God and Jesus Christ. Um, and again, without being like my wife, obviously, and three kids in my family have been through a lot in this last three weeks, what, six, seven weeks now. Um, it was quite scary. But for me, it was it was very, very humbling that I'd made all these little changes over a long three, four year period. The medication was gone. My senses were alive. And although I was very erratic and scary, three diagnoses, type 2 bipolar, emotional and stable personality disorder, and complex PTSD. I don't know if you can have all three. Um, when I went back out into the wild and I was running barefoot and I was, I was at peace and, like, I knew I was in a good place, although mentally I wasn't in a great place. I knew I was on a journey. They, they um, call that a breakthrough, though, don't they? they it's, yeah. It's, it's like when you... It's like a a butterfly when it's emerging from a chrysalis it's not pretty no but it's it got, wasn't yeah my mate told me exactly the same thing he, he calls it his breakthrough yeah it um, was, it was it, it, beautiful like like yeah i could go in there's a youtube video on my channel of me going down two bridges with my wife this time and throwing myself back off the wall i checked the water but the time i i did i wouldn't recommend it to anybody but i had such faith in what was going on in that moment I didn't question anything from just crawling and walking and like like tracking gr- 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 uh, grouse or where they were. I was, like my feet, my legs were all cut to ribbons, my arms, and there was two blokes on the two cliffs down Plin Bridge. And again, I don't recommend doing it. I'd swam across. I'm a dog with me, and I tested the water. I knew it was deep enough. It's on the SAS program. Are you tough enough? Where it is? And I just got up on that ledge. And I knew at that moment I had complete and utter faith in what was happening, although it looked quite scary from the outside looking in. And I just threw myself back. Didn't hurt. Didn't hurt mm. at all. Didn't throw my dog off. And then when I'd done it the second time, it did hurt because I was aware of what I was doing. Uh, but Folks again, I don't at know home, why. this we're not recommending you do this in any no, way, shape, no, or form. No, 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 no. That is not what I'm saying. But for me, that was my breakthrough coming out. Um, and I've been at peace ever since. And that's what all my channels are about now. It's about providing the light and the dark, like through through dark paid partnership, Pantheon gyms down on Cambridge road. I know I'm plugging things a little bit, but I've I've got so many people to thank at the end, but I'm at a place now where all I want to do is help others give back. Right. I'm, I'm good. I'm so good inside. Like if I can give a little piece of this cake to someone, just one person will be a win. But we just need to wake up, guys, because heaven is but a few steps away. It really is beautiful. Daniel, where where can people find you? Where can you find me? You can find me at Daniel Ford Stewart on Facebook or Beacon of Hope, Love, Joy and Peace on Instagram and YouTube. Um, Yeah, and just just give it a click, a like and a share, guys. I'm, I'm here to spread a message of hope through photography and my ability to chat. I want people to come into the light and see that you can make a few changes and just just wake up every day and just be thankful for the blessing that is life. It's beautiful, guys. Just jump on board. Um, yeah, I don't know where we are. I've got a few thank yous at some point. A lot of thank yous, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, so along my journey, and it's, it's been a very long four-year journey of letting things go, I've got the British Legion, um, combat stress, rock to recovery, 
improving lives, battling on, Pantheon Gym, Ben Wadham. We've got the Reorg charity, Sam Sheriff MBE. Um, a guy at the moment, Sam, uh, uh, Mitesh Bediani, he's done the, the Smile Star scheme. Me and my wife, with the blessing of our family, have just been asked to go out to Northeast India next year and provide dental care for the, the less fortunate people in a place where Western charities aren't. Um, he's been a great guy. The, the, the gastro ward Norfolk at Derriford and the Glenbourne unit for just judging, not judging me, looking into my eyes and see I was hurting and I was a human being that just needed understanding. Um, that's what we need to do is look in our eyes, people's eyes. Erwin Mitchell and Hugh James, um, we were my solicitors fighting the MOD at the moment for for what I feel is rightly my family's. Um, three Dark, I'll just mention them. Uh, and then I suppose Tugboats and Dolphins, which is Devon and Cornwall, a food action live. We're doing a charity swim on the 22nd, a cold water immersion for as long as possible. Um Dunners, Mike Dunn, he's a bootneck Royal Marine. He's running that. Um, they provide six or six, three to six hundred miles, three miles at Christmas. Um, just want to help people, right? Um, and then I suppose church, my church family, St. James, uh, Phil Brockenshire, Gav Skim, and all his family, and all my church, beautiful family. And then lastly, my one rock and my bedstone is uh, my beautiful wife, Catherine. Without Catherine by my side, and my, my obviously my mum and dad, but my, my kids. I wouldn't be here. I'm not that I wouldn't be here today. I just wouldn't be the person I am in front of you now, which is at peace and just wanting to help people. And um, I suppose that's kind of it for me, I suppose. Absolutely, brother. I think you nailed it. And we'll put thank you. We'll put all your links below this podcast, folks, so you can thank you guys. You can get in touch. So that just me leaves me to say much love to you, Daniel, and your wonderful family. Thank you much so love much. To you. Thank you for coming on the show. Also, big up for being honest, you know, and not living in the ego and just just saying it how it is. Friends out there listening, um, you know, if you're struggling, get in touch. Get in touch with an organize one of the organizations like Daniel said. Safa's always a good one to, to yeah. start with. Don't don't um be sitting out there in pain folks because we've all done it and the way out of it is take take action i'd suggest leave the past behind it doesn't exist leave the ego behind because that's just going to tie you down comparing yourself to other people and what have they achieved and what are you and when you're feeling low let's be honest you feel like even if you've been in the commandos like we have you still feel like you haven't achieved much in life um leave that behind Tune into the bigger picture. Remember, you're massively loved, whether you know it or not. And um, yeah, take your next step on your journey. And uh, as we we will both attest, <laughs> it will be worthwhile. Much love, friends. Thank you. God bless.